Okay, have y'all ever wondered why um, <coughs> the Jews don't offer animal sacrifices anymore? The main, huh? No temple? They don't have a temple. Their temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now see, when Israel, when Jesus came in and presented himself as king of the Jews, they rejected him a week later and had him crucified. So in 70 AD, the Roman legions came in and totally destroyed all of Jerusalem. They tore down the temple uh, and Israel as a nation ceased to exist until May 1948. Never has a nation ever been totally destroyed and then come back to life again except Israel. So what about this temple? Well, since this ultimate sacrifice was offered 2,000 years ago, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. And Hope told me to talk loud because the microphone doesn't pick me up very well. Um, since the, since the uh, ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ shed his blood, then there's no need for any animal sacrifices anymore, even if the Jews had a temple. So because... Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. There is still a temple, but it's not made with hands. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 16, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And so if you're a Christian, if you really know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the moment that you trusted Him as His Savior, you became alive spiritually for the first time in your life. When you were born as a baby, you were alive mentally, you were alive physically, but you were dead spiritually. The moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become alive spiritually for the first time, and that's called being born again. And Jesus said, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. So we have to be alive spiritually, and the only way we can be alive spiritually is when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. So God doesn't touch your dead spirit and bring it to life. The Spirit of God enters into us. It says this, the, uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus in you, the hope of glory. So the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you and you become the part of the temple of, of Jesus Christ, the temple of God. So in 1 Corinthians it says, do you not know that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So you may not be aware of the fact that you are the temple of God. Every Christian is a temple of God. God lives in us. So God doesn't have to live in some temple in Jerusalem. He lives in us. Now, today we're going to be talking about the fact that before we Gentiles became Christians, we were nobodies in the world. We were nothing. And once we become Christians and trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become the family of God and we become citizens of heaven. Now, I don't know how you feel when you go on vacation and come home, but I know several years ago we went to Peru for almost a month. And we took a whole team of college students down there and we ministered all over Peru for 10 days. No, for almost a month. For almost a month. And it was great. But when we got home, it was kind of like, oh, so good to be back home. And then a few years ago, the Lord provided a way for Hope and I to go to Israel for 10 days for free. And part of that was y'all. And uh, I, I was in that movie, um, Woodlawn. And y'all didn't know I was a movie star, some of you, but I was, in, I was on the big screen all over the United States. And so the Irwin Brothers Motion Pictures, they do a lot of movies. They, they, I, I was in the movie. So they called me up. Hank Irwin says, hey, how'd you like to go to Israel? I said, I can't afford to go to Israel. He says, no, it's on us. You just come and get on the plane. It's free. You go for 10 days for free. And I remember saying, oh, I said, Hank, thanks. I, hope, I told Hope, I says, they want me to go with them to Israel. It won't cost me anything. They're going to pay everything. And so I told Hope, I said, I wish you could go. I said, but I'm going to pray that God provides a way for you to go too. But don't say anything to the church because I don't want them to, to know I said that because they'll think I'm begging for money or something. But I don't know how Gene Walker found out. And we had announcements one day, and I said, any more announcements? And Gene got up, she said, I have one. And I said, what? She says, Jim's getting to go to Jerusalem for free. I think we need to pray about sending hope 
So that next Wednesday night, they says, don't come to prayer meeting. I said, why? Just don't come to prayer meeting. So we didn't come. So after prayer meeting, some folks came over and said, we've been praying about this thing and we just want you to know we're going we're to pay all the hopes way to Israel and we're going to give you all $500 spending money and we're going to give you a raise in pay. I went, wow. So we went to Israel for 10 days, didn't cost us anything. And it was exciting. And people said, oh, it's so good to know that you walked where Jesus walked. And it kind of hit me. No, the whole, time, the whole time I was in Israel, I was there with Jesus. I was talking to him the whole time. Jesus, this is where, you know, this is where you got crucified. Oh, this is where you were buried in the tomb. And this is where you were here and there. And I felt like I went to Israel with Jesus. I was talking to him the whole time. So when we got back home, it was kind of like, oh, that was great. But it sure is good to be back home. And then you go on vacation. You know, we go to Smoky Mountains once or twice a year for about a week and it's fun we get back home it's like oh it's nice to be back home and I remember the first time I ever had surgery I'd never been in the hospital except when I was born and so I was going to have back surgery and uh, so they called me in there and they says now Mr. Vale you know, you know going, you're going to have surgery on your back and you've never had an operation before so we want to tell you what to expect now you're going to go in we're going to put you to sleep and we're going to do the surgery they're going to take you into recovery and when you're in recovery, that's where you're going to be waking up and you're going to feel kind of goofy. Well, I thought, if I'm going to feel goofy, I'm on plan how to be goofy. So I had my surgery and I, I, I remember I was waking up and I had something like Vaseline in my eyes or something. And I was waking up after surgery and I was thinking, where am I? And I oh, oh, this is, I've had surgery. This is where I'm, I must be in recovery. This is where I'm supposed to feel goofy. Well, I planned on how to be goofy. So you folks who've seen The Wizard of Oz, you'll know what I'm talking about. I woke up and I could see the nurse over there with her back to me. And so I closed my eyes and like on The Wizard of Oz, I said, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. She said, Mr. Vail, are you awake? And I said, Annie M, is that you? She said, oh, you're stupid, man. Go back to sleep. So I, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed being goofy. So anyway, uh, when you come home from a long trip, you really are, you're glad to be back home. Now there's one, there's one thing you we're looking forward to. Jesus Christ is going to come in the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's going to come and get us in the rapture and all the scripture is fulfilled. He could come back today. Now, you look at the title of the sermon, and at one point we were just aliens or pilgrims or strangers in the world. Now we're actually part of the family of God. But there's something interesting about that. The earth, the Bible says, is not our home anymore. The earth is not, we're just strangers and pilgrims down here. But heaven is our home. The only thing is we've never been there to enjoy our home. So when I go out of town, or I'm hoping I've gone out of town, we come home and it's like, oh, it's good to be back home. After I have surgery, you know, if I survive that, I'll be coming home. It's like, oh, it's good to be back home. But see, I've been home. I know what it's like to be home. But when we, when we get to heaven, we, we don't know what it's like to be home spiritually. When you see Jesus Christ face to face, you think, well, I don't know. I can't picture heaven. It, we're going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp or something. That's kind of boring. I don't think I'm going to like heaven too much. That's not how it's going to be. When we get to heaven and we see Jesus Christ face to face and we're there with the whole family of God and we're all going to know each other and we're all going to be hugging and everything else. Else, It's going to be better than anything we've ever had down here. And it's going to be like, it's so good to be home, even though we've never been home. So today we want to talk about that a little bit. And uh, in First, uh, in the, uh, first Peter, First Peter chapter two. Now, last week we left off at verse six. I got really long-winded, like I usually do, and so we're going to go over to chapter two, starting in verse six. Now it says, "Behold, I lay in Zion. Now Zion, that's Jerusalem. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone." Well, why does he say that? Because the temple has been torn down in 70 A.D. by the Romans. But there's another temple. And it's not going to be, there's going to be another temple. But this temple he's talking about is us. 
We are the temple of the living God. But every building had a chief cornerstone. Now what was the chief cornerstone? It was this great big rock that's cut out to be the perfect shape so when you put the walls going this way, they'll be where they're supposed to be. You put the walls from the chief cornerstone and, it, and they go this way at a perfect 90 degree angle. And then as the walls go up, the top of that stone, everything's gonna be level. So the chief cornerstone makes sure that that building goes up in the proper direction and the proper dimensions. Now, God says his temple today is us. But with that temple that God lives in in us, there's a chief cornerstone. And that chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ. But the problem is the nation of Israel rejected that chief cornerstone. They didn't want Jesus Christ. They rejected him. And so God says, Behold, I lay in Zion, or in Jerusalem, a chief cornerstone. And then he describes it. Elect. God chose that chief cornerstone. Precious. He who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone. And if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will never be ashamed. You, you'll, you, you're never going to come to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a child of the devil. I'm going to hell when I die. I have sinned against God. I've been in the Romans 5. It says I'm an enemy of God, but I believe Jesus Christ died for me on the cross. He shed his blood for me. He took the punishment for my sins. I'm guilty, but he took the punishment. I'm guilty, but the sentence was carried out on him. I'm guilty, but he paid the fine on my behalf. And then when he died, after shedding his blood, he rose again from the dead three days later. And I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and I want him to come into my life, and I want him to forget, ask him to forgive me, cleanse me from my sin, my sinful lifestyle being, lifestyle being my own God. I've been living to please myself. I do what I want to do, go where I want to go. I've been God in my life. And I want Jesus now to be my Savior and to be my Lord. So I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you will never be ashamed. Why? Because He's never going to say, no, I don't want you. If you come to Jesus Christ, it says He will not turn you away. If you realize you're a sinner, you're dead spiritually, you're an enemy of God, you're a child of the devil, and when you die, if you get killed today, you're going to go to hell. But if you realize, I need a Savior, and I want Jesus Christ to come into my life and to change my life and forgive me of my sin and give me eternal life and make me a child of God. And the Bible says when you do that, you're legally adopted into God's family. You can call God, the Aramaic word that the common people spoke was Abba. What is Abba? It's a word that doesn't mean father. It's the familiar ter term for father. It's daddy. You mean I can, when I come to Christ, I can call God Daddy? This sounds blasphemous. It might sound blasphemous to, to you, but God says you can call God Daddy. When I went into the hospital just a few weeks ago to have these uh, biopsies to see if I had any more cancer, I didn't know what to expect. And we were there in the hotel that night, and I knew that next morning I was going to go in, they're going to put me to sleep, and they're going to do biopsies to see if there are any cancer cells left after they took that tumor out. And I didn't know what to expect. Because the, the uh, young doctor who came in first, he was a resident. He said, well, Mr. Vale, I'm looking at your chart here and I can see you've got uh, bladder cancer, so we're going to take your bladder out and then we're going to do some checking around see if it's spread to your lungs. Wow, thanks a lot, buddy. That's really encouraging. Well, he didn't know what he was talking about. So that night before I was going to go in and have biopsies, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if they're going to do biopsies and say, yes, you're full of cancer. We're going to have to take your bladder out and uh, it's spread to your lungs. Uh, so you might have six months to a year to live. And as you remember, my daddy died when I was 14 years old. He died of cancer when he was 42. My mama died of cancer when she was 59. So I was in that hotel that night, and I didn't know what to expect, but I just says, Daddy, I told God, Daddy, I love you, and I know you love me. 
And I just, I know you want the best for my life. So whatever it is you decide, I go along with that. And I snuggled up. The Bible says in, in Psalm 91, says he will cover you with his feathers and under the shadow of, of his wing, you'll, you'll be protected, you'll be safe. And so I pictured a little baby chick snuggling up to his mama, getting under her wing, getting under those feathers and sticking my little head out. And I knew when I went to sleep that night, I was snuggled up to my daddy in heaven and he loved me and he's going to take care of me. And I didn't have to worry about anything because whatever he decided I wanted because I wanted to be in the center of his will. So when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, Jesus Christ is your chief cornerstone, but God becomes your daddy. The creator of the universe is your daddy. The God who spoke the whole universe into existence and he created all the intricacies of nature and your human body. He's your daddy. And so he says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. You will not have to be ashamed. Coming to Jesus Christ saying, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. He's never going to say, no, get out of here. <laughs> if you are sincere that you really want Christ, he's never going to turn you away. And so then it says, the stone which the builders rejected. So Israel had a chance to trust Jesus Christ as their, as their king, the king of the Jews. They said, crucify him, crucify him. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The whole church, the body of Christ, God's temple is built upon Jesus Christ. And so Israel rejected him. But now we have the Gentiles. What were Gentiles? Gentiles are people who are not Jews. And Gentiles were, were considered dogs by Jews. Gentiles were unclean. Gentiles were scum of the earth. And anybody who was not a Jew back then, they considered them just scum, dogs, Gentile dogs. Well, we, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile dog. Well, we were a Gentile dog. And so it says... The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Well, so now we are part of the, the body of Christ. We're part of the temple of God. We're adopted into God's family, and we can call God Daddy. And so it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now let's talk about Jesus being the stone for a minute. I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. In Exodus chapter 17, Israel had been in, the, in, the, in Egypt for 400 years as slaves. 400 years, that's a long time. They've been slaves for 400 years. And so all of a sudden, God raises up Moses and he said, Moses, go to Pharaoh and you tell him to let my people go. And Pharaoh said, I'm not going to do it. And God brought a plague on Israel and it was terrible. And it was a plague that was designed, they worshiped all kind of weird gods in Egypt. And each plague was designed to make that particular God that the Egyptians worshiped look stupid. And so finally, after all these plagues, finally the firstborn of Egypt died. The Pharaoh's son died. All the firstborn in Egypt died. And the only reason the firstborn of the Jews didn't die is because God says, take a perfect little lamb without spot or, spot or blemish, kill that little, keep it in your home for several days, Kids get attached to it. They love that little lamb. You've been feeding it. Now you've got to cut its throat. And take that blood and put it over the doorpost and on either, over the top of the door and on the doorpost on either side. And any firstborn who goes into a house with blood on the door, God didn't care if he was good or bad. What mattered was whether by faith he'd get under the blood or not. And if that firstborn got under the blood, he didn't die. But the Egyptians didn't do that. And so all the firstborn Egyptians all died that night. But the firstborn Jews lived because they by faith got under the blood. And what gives you eternal life is when you by faith get under the blood of Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you on the cross. And that's what gets you to heaven. It's not your good works. It's what Jesus did. And so when they got ready to uh, leave... Egypt, they went out into the wilderness to head to the promised land and it was hot and dry and they started griping and saying, we don't have anything to drink out here. I don't have, I don't have a canteen or anything. And Moses, you brought us, we had plenty of stuff to drink in Egypt. You brought us out here in the desert to kill us. We're dying of thirst. And so in Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, 
It says, well, let me start in verse 3. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses, and they said, Why is it you've brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. And also take your, in your hand the rod which you struck the river with, the Red Sea, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. So he obeyed God. He went to this big rock, and he struck it with his staff, and when he did, water came out. Clean, pure, crystal clear water, and they had plenty of water to drink. And they were finally, they quit griping. Later on, they traveled around some more. They got hot and thirsty again. So they started griping and complaining uh, to Moses. And so we come to Numbers chapter 20, verse 2. Now there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron again. Aaron was his brother. And the people contended, fought with Moses, and they spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought us up? Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went to the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting and they fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod which you and your brother Aaron uh, and you and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together but God didn't say strike the rock. He said speak to the rock. Oh, first time God, God told him to strike the rock. God says, this time, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before, uh, from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, Moses got mad. He lost his temper. Here now, you rebels, must you bring water? Uh, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. But then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and he said, Because you did not believe me to hall hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. And so God says, Moses, because you didn't speak to the rock, you struck it instead, you're not going to be allowed to go into the promised land. Well, that's kind of tough cookies. Why, why would God do that? Why would he be so tough on Moses that Moses didn't strike the rock a second time? I mean, he didn't speak to the rock the second time. He struck it a second time. Well, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. And it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. So when they were coming out of Egypt, they're wandering in the wilderness. They, there was a pillar of cloud like a tornado, a pillar of cloud during the day, and there's a pillar of fire by night. And they were to follow that pillar of cloud by day, and they were to follow it at night or when they camped, that that pillar of fire would be there to protect them. More of brethren, I don't want you to be under a, uh, uh, unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses. That doesn't mean that they went and got baptized like we do in church. It means they were identified with their leader when they went through the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. It's called manna. Man, the word manna means what is it? They all ate the sp same spiritual food and they drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. So everywhere they went, they turned around and there's this rock. And then they went to another place and they camped out. There's this rock. <clears throat> they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Uh-oh. 
Why would God tell Moses, you struck that rock a second time and because you did that, you can't go into the promised land? Because Jesus Christ, that rock represented Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ would die for your sin and my sins only one time. Jesus would never die a second time. For one, by one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you trust in his sacrifice that he made only one time. People say, well, I, I forgot to confess my sins, so I lost my salvation. I got to be saved again. No, you don't. Jesus died on the cross one time for every sin you've ever committed, every sin you commit now, and every sin you'll commit in the future. He took the punishment for every sin you will ever commit in your whole lifetime by one sacrifice. He'll never sacrifice ever again. And they don't need to offer animal sacrifices because the ultimate sacrifice was offered 2,000 years ago. And in John chapter 1, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he said that twice in chapter 1. So if you die today without Christ, you will bust hell wide open. I remember when I, when I heard the gospel after wrestling practice. I was on a wrestling team for four years. After wrestling practice, somebody told me about Jesus Christ. That was in October. I didn't want to hear it. They told me anyway. And I did not want to come to Christ because if I came to Christ, I thought I would live a boring life and I'd never have fun ever again. And so for six months, I thought it. And by the way, just not bragging, when Yerba came out in senior year, I was class, senior class favorite. And if I came to Christ, I felt like I wouldn't be a favorite of anybody. I was concerned about myself and my reputation. And so I rejected Jesus Christ until April of the next year. And I got tired of fighting it. And one night I gave my life to Jesus Christ and he changed my life. And I don't know why I was so stupid, but the night I came to Christ, I was in this revival for teenagers, for high school kids, and the preacher was preaching. And you heard the story. They sat me down on the front row with my, my buddy who became my roommate at the University of Alabama. They sat me on the front row. They said, we don't have any more seats except for these two places right here. So the preacher started preaching. Guess what he preached on? He preached on hell. And he says, some of you people have been rejecting Jesus Christ for months and months and months. And if you get killed on the way home in a car wreck tonight, you're going to bust hell wide open. And I told Bill, I said, I don't appreciate this. He said, what? I said, you told him I'm here. He's talking about me. He said, Dig, I didn't know you exist. I said, I know good and well you and Linda were begging me to come because y'all set me up. You told him that I'm going to be here. You arranged for me to sit on the front row and this guy's preaching on hell and he says, if I get killed on the way home tonight, I'm going to bust hell wide open and I know y'all set me up and I was mad. But at the end of the service, he said, if you want to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're tired of running, I want you to come down to the front. Well, I was already at the front. And I was, they started singing that closing hymn, and my hymn book was shaking just like that. And I thought, why am I fighting Jesus Christ? I must be crazy. And I said, and I decided I'm going to go down front. Well, I was already down front. I took my hymn book, I dropped it on the floor. And I went down to the front, and I started crying. 17-year-old guy on the wrestling team. By, by this, yeah, 17 years old. And the preacher said, what's wrong, son? I said, I didn't know the lingo. I said, I need help. He said, you need Jesus, don't you? And I said, yes, sir, I do. That night I came to know Jesus Christ and he changed my life. Now, oops. And so it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling. Israel stumbled over Christ and a rock of offense. They were offended at him. They didn't want him. 
And there are people living today who don't want Christ. They rather have their sin. They want to say, I want to have all the sex I can have. And if I get pregnant, then I want to abort my baby. Oh, but I don't want to be a boy anymore. I want to become a girl. And I don't want to be a girl anymore. I want to become a boy. And I just want to live however I want to. And I don't need God because I I want drugs. I, I, I've got an empty place in my life. I feel unloved. I feel rejected. I'm angry. I'm bitter. I'm resentful. I'm going to take drugs and, and escape from all that. But don't talk to me about Jesus. I don't want him. I'd rather just take drugs and maybe get a little fentanyl and die of an overdose. People kill each other for drugs. Why? Because they reject Jesus Christ. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. In other words, God calls people to come to Christ, but most people don't want him. So if I go to Matthew 21, starting in verse 33, it says, Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard where you grow grapes. And he set a hedge around it. He dug a wine press in it and he built a tower and he leased it to vine dressers and he went into a far country. Now, when the vintage time drew near, this, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that the uh, servants might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and let's seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes... What will he do to these vine dressers? They said, uh, they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of the season. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation, taking it from Israel to a nation of Gentiles. It will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was talking about them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, Jesus, they feared the multitudes because the multitudes took him for a prophet. So most people don't want Jesus Christ. Broad is the way that leads to death. Narrow is the way that leads to life. <clears throat> so he says... <clears throat> But you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You mean, you mean Jim Vale? A Gentile dog is now a child of God, and God says you are a chosen generation? God chose you. You are important to God. God's saying, I want you to be my child. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. What does that mean? It means I don't have to go to a human priest. I don't have to go confess my sins to a priest. I don't have to go and, and ask a priest to pray for me. No, I can go directly to God. But it says... <clears throat> You are a royal priesthood. That means we can pray for people and God will hear us and God many times will say yes or he'll say no or he'll say wait. We can go directly to God. We don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to pray to God through me. You pray directly to the Lord if you're a Christian. I was scuba diving in Crystal River, Florida and I didn't have a gauge and all of a sudden I thought, hey, it seems like it's kind of hard to, hard to breathe. And I thought it was just psychological because I was down there at the bottom and I was swimming along with the fish and it was beautiful. And all of a sudden, I, I took a breath. I didn't have any air. My tank was empty. My first thought was, Lord Jesus, you're down here with me. I'm not going to be afraid. Help me not to panic. So I was, in, I was in Crystal River on the bottom with no air. Lord, what do I do? I unfastened my tank. I dropped my tank. Luckily, I wasn't too deep. And I swam up to the top, got a cramp in my right leg. But the whole time I was there with no air, I was thinking, Lord, you're here with me. Jesus, you're here with me. 
And so he says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. America's not holy anymore. We've turned our backs on God. Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ is politi politically incorrect. But we're a holy nation. Who's, a, who's the holy nation? All Christians all over the world. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here I was, a wrestler who didn't want Jesus Christ and I was living in darkness. And then after that guy says, hey, you're going to get, you get in the car wreck tonight, you're going to bust hell wide open. I came to Christ and all of a sudden I went from spiritual darkness to spiritual light. It's like a big light came on. Who, who once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Gentile people. We were pagans. We were heathen. We were Gentile dogs. And now we are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. God wants you and, and me to become his children if we haven't. And when you become God's child by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, God adopts you into his family and you can call the creator of the universe, Daddy. And he loves you more than any daddy you've ever had down here. There are good daddies down here and there are crummy daddies down here. God is a perfect daddy. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And nothing can stop you from being loved and from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God's a perfect daddy, and he loves you, and he'll never turn his back on you. So you are now a citizen of heaven if you know Christ. And it says, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as strangers and pilgrims. See, this is not our home anymore. I'm a stranger down here on this earth. I'm a pilgrim down here on this earth. Heaven's my home, and I can't wait to get home, even though I've never been there at home. I've never been to home, but I'm looking forward to it. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your soul. If you're a Christian, you're still capable of lusting. You're still capable of sinning, but you don't want to because Jesus changes your want to, but you're capable of it. God says stay away from that. There, every, every Christian has some sin that they fall into more easily than other sins. See, my, mine's homemade pecan pie. Now, everybody has some sin they're attracted to. And so he says, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. You belong to Jesus Christ, but there's part of you that still likes to sin. He says, don't let that take control of you. Stay close to Jesus. It says, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. So other Gentile dogs will see how your life has changed and you're now a child of God and they're going to decide, hey, I want that too. And I had people, the night I came to Christ, we went to Zeke's Hamburgers. Zeke's Hamburgers, that's where everybody hung out. It was years ago they had happy days with Fonzie and all them. <clears throat> Zeke's Hamburgers was like, like owls on happy days. That's where everybody went. After a football game, everybody went to Zeke's. And they'd be sitting out there in the hood of the car and they'd be talking and laughing. And we'd go in there and get stuffed hamburgers and french fries and Cokes and stuff. And so I went to Zeke's Hamburgers. And we were all popular in our school. And so we went there and it was kind of late. And they says, where have y'all been? I said, man, you guys would not believe what happened to me tonight. What happened? I, tonight I became a Christian. I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. And I know I'm forgiven and I know I'm going to heaven when I die. And they all fell down laughing. You mean you've got religion? No, I got Jesus. Oh, give me a break. Well, God has a sense of humor because some of those same guys today are now in the ministry. And so it says, I'm almost done. I'm going to quit right here. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, as strangers, abstain from fleshly lusts at war against the soul. Now, those things can't send you to hell, but they can keep you from enjoying your fellowship with your heavenly daddy having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, and that's what they did that night at Zeke's, you got religion, oh my goodness, you stupid man. When they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. What is that? When they see your changed life and what God has done in your life, 
then they will decide, hey, when God speaks to my heart, I want Jesus too. I'm going to close with Matthew 5.16. In Matthew 5.16 it says, you are, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And if you're a Christian, you are the light. You're a light hidden on a, uh, set on a hill to shine in the, in the world of darkness so people see the reality of Christ. You have the greatest reason to live. I have, I've had people I've witnessed to and I've ministered to who are talking about suicide. And I said, suicide, suicide is the ultimate form of rebellion against God. When you commit suicide, what you're saying is, God, it's going to be my way or no way. And I had someone recently on the phone long distance. And they said, my, my life sucks. And I think I'm going to kill myself. And I said, you can do that if you want to, but you're going to stand before God if you do. And you're going to have given a, a reason to him why you took the most precious gift God could give you, and that's your life. You're going to have to answer to God for that. Do you want to stand before God having killed yourself when God gave you life and you took it away? Well, it changed their tune real quick and they came to Christ as their Savior. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under, under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You and I, if we're Christians, we have the greatest reason to live. We don't have to live, we don't have to, live to try to make a lot of money. We don't have to live to be good looking forever. We don't have to live to try to be, appear to be successful. We don't have to live to have the biggest, fanciest house and the best bass boat and, and all the kind. No, we got something better. You can sit down with a person without Christ. And maybe they're doing drugs. Maybe they're, commit, they're, they're considering suicide. They're totally at rock bottom. And you can tell them, what, listen, this is what Jesus did for me. This is what he can do for you. And you, you get into scripture to where you know what to say. And you tell them about Jesus Christ. And before your very eyes, they trust Christ. And one moment they're dead spiritually, they're a child of the devil, they're on their way to hell, they're an enemy of God. Right before your eyes, they come to Christ. They're forgiven. They're a child of God. They're a citizen of heaven. They're an ambassador of heaven. It's right before your eyes. That's the greatest reason to live. I was in Crystal River, Florida years ago. And I stopped by the 7-Eleven store. And as I was coming out, a car, a, a, a kind of a souped up kind of looking car, station wagon type thing, pulled up. They had a little trailer behind it. And it was a rock band. They were coming from St. Petersburg, where they'd been playing the night before. And their name of their band was Acid Flash. That's back when everybody was doing, uh, I forgot what it's called, LSD. Their band was called Acid Flash. They were a bunch of hippies. And so as I was coming out, they were getting ready to go in. And I handed them a gospel track. I handed one of them. I said, hey, can I give you something? I said, the message of this little book changed my life several years ago. I didn't say the book did, the message of it. The message of this little book totally changed my life several years ago. And I would like to share it with you. And the guy says, oh, okay, thanks, buddy. I dig that. I can dig that. And so... He said, matter of fact, tell me what happened. And so I started talking to him, and he said, come get in the car with me. So I sat down with him, and I was sharing Jesus Christ. One of the other guys came out and said, what are y'all talking about? He said, this guy's telling me about this little booklet. And uh, so I gave them all one. They said, well, what, what, tell us about it. So I, I told them about Jesus Christ and how he changed my life. And all of a sudden, these guys, the light came on. And they said, man, we've never heard this before. This is amazing. We want Jesus to be our Savior. And right there, this acid, fla uh, acid flash band, they prayed right there in the car to receive Christ as their Savior. And after that, they, I kept up with them for a little while. They said, from now on, we're singing to glorify Jesus Christ. I don't know what they sang. They said, from now on, we're singing as a band to glorify Jesus Christ. It changed their lives. And it's so exciting. And we were down in Peru, in Huaraz, Peru, up in the Andes Mountains, where the mountains are all covered in snow. Beautiful. 
And we're in this little church, and it was made out of adobe bricks. And they had a bad storm, and the roof caved in before we got there. So they cleaned it all out, still had the walls. They put up like a circus tent thing to cover where the roof used to be. And they had a light bulb over the sanctuary, I mean over the, uh, the uh, congregation. They had a light bulb on a wire over the pulpit. And in, in the back room back here, there's a light bulb where the pastor and his wife and little kids lived. And I told them, I said, do you realize you are the only Christian Christ-honoring church in all of what I was? And you have the greatest reason to live. You have tourists coming over here from all over the world to go whitewater rafting in the Andes Mountains. You have people here in your town that are going to hell. And you can share Jesus Christ with these people. You have the greatest reason to live. You're like secret agents for God, except you're not secret about it. So today, if you know Christ is your Savior, you are a citizen of heaven. You are a child of God. You're a, a priest of God. You can pray for people and see things happen. You can share Jesus Christ and see lives changed.